Uh, thank you, Achieve Minneapolis, for hosting this conversation. It's really great to see so many uh, familiar uh, and new faces. Um, I've got some friends over here, my partner. Just want to say, hey, boo, shout him out. Uh, <laughs> some um, uh, past and present coworkers as well. Um, and again, my name is Jason Buckland. I use he and him pronouns, and I'm the LGBTQ program coordinator with Minneapolis Public Schools, which is the, called the Out for Good program. Now, a couple assumptions that get sometimes made uh, when uh, talking about the Out for Good program, uh, people might assume it's a relatively new program um, and that the work is primarily for high schoolers. Um, we really see the work as starting um, as early as pre-K, and I'll unpack that later for you all, um, explain that. And then also, um, something that I'd like to point out is Minneapolis Public Schools and St. Paul Public Schools have a really long history of being dedicated towards our LGBTQ students, families, and staff. So back in 1996, the Out for Good program was formed in Minneapolis, and then right across the river, we had the Out for Equity program in St. Paul Public Schools. At that time, Minneapolis and St. Paul had a third of the nation's resources when it came to LGBTQ uh, resources and education. And on the one hand, it's kind of cool, it's like, oh, hey, a third of the nation's resources are in the Twin Cities. And on the other hand, it's kind of terrible that a third of the nation's resources are located in the Twin Cities, right? And so um, uh, luckily, though, that's not the case now. Um, we see districts all across the nation, including our LGBTQ students, and really making changes to systems that ultimately weren't designed with them in mind. But we do know that change is possible and that we can right that wrong, right? Um, so we've seen work in St. Louis Park, uh, Osseo, Hopkins, uh, Minnesota Department of Education um, published a transgender uh, student toolkit for the whole state of Minnesota to use, right? So we're at this moment where just really in the last five years, school districts have really taken on this conversation in a new way, and we're seeing lots of really cool results from that. Um, so before we get started with the conversation, um, I just want to make sure we have some grounding assumptions. Um, whenever you're having an equity conversation, um, uh, it's good to have a few grounding assumptions. And whenever we're talking about folks that are marginalized in our systems, that's an equity conversation, right? And so um, I just want to um, ask us all to first start off with um, uh, engage, lean in and experience discomfort, right? And discomfort, discomfort is where learning happens. And discomfort is going to look different for different people. So maybe when I started out and I was like, hey, my pronouns are he and him, folks are like, well, that's new, and that's different, and that's cool. If that's your discomfort, lean into that. That's a good place to be, right? Some folks might be like, I think about how gender impacts my life every day. <laughs> I've talked about this. I have a gender unicorn in my classroom. I know this. So what's your discomfort then, right? Is it talking to your administrators? Is it redirecting negative behavior or negative language from students and staff members? Find your place to kind of like, key in and, and get involved in the conversation in the way that you can. Um, so a couple places that we're going to go in our conversation. Um, we're first going to ground ourselves in our own journey about, around gender. Sometimes, again, in equity conversations, we go, oh, I'm going to learn about those people over there. Or I'm going to learn about these people over here. But really, this work is about us, right? So I want to make sure that we take time uh, to think about our own relationship to gender, how gender's impacted our lives, um, and the way it's played out. Um, I also want to make the connection that LGBT inclusion work is ultimately gender equity work, and gender impacts all of us. So we are going to spend the first maybe half of our time together really making that link between LGBT inclusion work and gender equity work and how that, again, uh, impacts all of us. Then we're going to unpack some terminology around uh, gender, especially for transgender, gender nonconforming, and non-binary students. Then we're going to talk about some strategies that uh, we can see in the classroom, and we're going to do it all in 20 minutes. <laughs> Sound good? All right, cool. Because I didn't have another plan, so I'm really glad that like, this is, we're all in agreement on this, right? OK, so first thing I want you to do, and normally when I have these conversations, we do a little pair and share and turn and talk moment. This format's not going to really provide space for that, so I'm just going to ask you to go with me on this um, for just a little bit. But I want you to think about what lessons did you learn growing up about gender? Where did you learn them? And how have those impacted your values? Which ones do you still carry with you? Which ones have you discarded? And so for some folks, it might be, you know, I grew up in a, a rural area, and so regardless of gender, we all pitched in on the chores because the chores had to get done. Some folks might... Um, have grown up in a family with really rigid definitions around gender, around how the, the rules of the house were laid out, around expectations around what you could wear or what you couldn't wear. Maybe it was okay for the, the girls to wear more masculine clothes, but not okay for the boys to wear more feminine clothes. 
Maybe you grew up in a single parent household and again, everybody just pitched in on the chores no matter what the gender was, right? So think about where you are um, and what values you had and grew up with around gender, right? Because ultimately, gender is a social construct, right? And on top of that social construct, there's also a cultural lens. And so my job in the school district is not to say, this is the good way to think about gender, this is the bad way to think about gender. We all have to understand that we all have different entry points into this conversation. And I'm more interested is, do we have a closed mindset about gender? Or do we have an open mindset about gender? Do the families and students we're working with, do they have a closed mindset about gender? Or an open mindset? Because that's gonna help us bridge connection and so that we can meet each other and, and share values and really make change and make inclusive spaces. So, to, um, even though we all have different experiences um, and different stories from our home about how we've constructed gender, there's still a few unwritten social contracts that I think we can all see play out. And so I just want to do a quick demonstration, um, and this will have some non-threatening audience participation involved. Cool? All right. Non-threatening audience participation. Um, and so uh, just to see that we do still have some unwritten uh, social norms and social constructs um, that, that, that we are all are part of. So let's say I'm going to use this speaker and I'm going to use that speaker. We're going to make a little spectrum. Let's say this side, this speaker over here, represents female and femininity. So all the different societal norms about what it means to be female or feminine. So how you walk, how you talk, how you wear your hair, how you show up, how you compete, just how you operate and move through the world. Same thing over here. Let's say this represents male and masculinity, how you walk, how you talk, how you compete, how you wear your hair, how you show up in the world, all those sorts of things, right? So let's say I was assigned female at birth. Um, the doctor's like, it's a girl. And then there was like a gender reveal party and there's balloons and lasagna or whatever I saw on Facebook recently, right? <laughs> and uh, as I get older though, I start doing things that are considered more masculine, right? So I'm assigned female at birth. As I get older, I'm starting to do things that are more masculine. This is where y'all come in. Tell me when society would say stop. Like stop, you've gone too far. Make sense? Cool, all right. So assigned female at birth, doing things that are masculine. Tell me when society would say stop. Stop? Yeah, right about here. This is kind of like a window, right about there, right? Okay. So let's say I'm assigned male at birth. Like it's a boy, and again, with the gender reveal parties and the lasagna and things like that. Um, did y'all see that story? Anyway, uh, assigned uh, male at birth, doing things that are more feminine. Tell me when society would say stop. stop. Yeah. Yeah. So that box is real narrow, and that line is drawn really strong. And so who knows that four-year-old boy who like runs around, plays dress up, really creative, hangs out with the girls, one day comes home from school and is like, I don't want to do that anymore. Make sense? Right? What are some of those things that that boy hears? Why doesn't he want to do that anymore? He's called names. He's teased. What do some of those names sound like? Sissy, gay. Yep. And I find it interesting, and this is the Minnesota the use of the word interesting. I find it interesting. <laughs> what do you think of my show? I thought it was interesting. Okay. So I find it interesting that we wrap someone's performance of masculinity to their sexuality. And to attack that masculinity, we attack their sexuality. And we start doing that, I've heard reports in the schools, as early as kindergarten, right? And so kid in preschool. So kids are using words they don't know what they mean, right? That's what they say, I'm they're just using the words, right? However, sometimes as adults and educators, we get afraid to actually intervene and talk about what that word means. So what the result is, is for six years, until we think it's developmentally appropriate to talk about it in a certain way, for six years, they get to develop a negative connotation between the word gay, meaning something bad. And then in sixth grade, we are supposed to untangle that and go, no, 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 actually, you know, we include all families and we include all people, but we've let them for six years learn a negative connotation between gay and um, something bad, unless we um, interject. And how that impacts all of us, so this is that link between LGBT inclusion and gender equity. Uh, 2014, some research came out from Dr. Dorothy Espelange, um, and when I learned about it, I kind of hung the entire work of Out for Good, the program I run, on this work. And it connects the following things together. We'll get to the unicorn. <laughs> okay. It shows that early childhood bullying behaviors in third and fourth grade by middle school start to become homophobic in nature. Then you've got to prove you're a man, you're not a sissy or a punk or whatever. And that often happens at the denigration of women. So that same behavior becomes sexual harassment in early high school. 
And by the end of high school, that same behavior can become teen dating violence. And so now you've got a statistical link between early childhood bullying behavior and teen dating violence with homophobia and transphobia somewhere in the middle. So what's the change in my own backyard? It's that homophobia piece. What's that really about? More often than not, it's about you're not acting like a woman or you're not acting like a man, right? And so when we make our spaces and our schools more inclusive for LGBT students around gender, what we're really doing is making spaces more inclusive for all of us who are performing gender, and we're all performing gender whether we realize it or not. From what classes we think we're good at, what jobs we get, how much emotion we're allowed to show, how we dress, how we show up in the world. So again, the more inclusive we make our spaces for LGBT students, the more uh, we make them inclusive for everybody. So I think it's important when you're naming big issues, and the big issues I'm naming here are misogyny, sexism, and uh, rape culture. I think it's important to find out your piece of the puzzle inside of that, or else it gets too big, right? And it seems like you're, you're powerless against it. So I name mine as homophobic bullying and transphobic bullying, but I encourage you to find your spot on this continuum to see what you can do to interrupt that. So with that, we're gonna unpack a little bit about that homophobic bullying piece and what we can do inside our classrooms to make um, them more inclusive so that we can interrupt this pipeline between bullying behavior and teen dating violence. Before we get there, as you saw the preview, there's a unicorn coming. I wanna unpack a little bit about the terminology, right? So sometimes uh, educators will come up to me and they'll be like, you know, because there's LGBT, LGBTQ, LGBTIQQA, there's a two, there's a P, there's all sorts of things, right? And folks will say like, oh, hey, I learned a new, I learned a new letter. And I'm like, that's awesome. And it's a reminder. <laughs> it is. Um, but the thing is, is that language changes. That's what language does. Language changes to meet the needs of communities and to provide voice to community, right? And so the words we know now, they might change later on. And we have to let that happen because language is fluid. The important thing to remember is that this is all gender and sexual diversity of which we're all a part of, right? This isn't, again, just about folks over here, folks over there. We're all a part of uh, gender and sexual diversity and we can all find ourselves on this unicorn somewhere. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly identify and define, yep, quickly identify and define a few of these terms, and I'm just gonna look at the top three because those have to do with gender, right? So I'm gonna start with sex assigned at birth because that's often where we have our own understanding of, of gender. We tie it to the sex assigned at birth, which is often just really decided by the doctor um, at looking at anatomy. So uh, sex assigned at birth, that's your hormones, your chromosomes, um, your anatomy, and again, often what's put on your birth certificate. We have female, we have male. We also have an intersex category that doesn't often get talked about. So uh, we know female is XX, yeah? Cool, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist, so I always need a reminder. Um, male is XY, but there's about 42 other pairings that can happen amongst those chromosomes. You can have XXY, you can have XXYY. When those pairings happen, that can influence how your hormones are distributed, and it might also influence how your anatomy is formed, and that's where we get the intersex category. About 2% of the world's population uh, identify as intersex, which is also the same number of redheads in the world as well. It's about 2%, so just to kind of give you a comparison <laughs> that way. Uh, gender identity, that's how you think about your gender. So it's your psychological sense of your gender. That's why we've got the rainbow up there, the little rainbow, the unicorn is thinking about the rainbow. It's your psychological sense of your gender. This uh, graph has a male category, a female category, and then if those words don't really work for you, there's a other category as well. So you can fill the line along those words as well and not be stuck in binary male-female language. Then there's your gender expression. It's how you communicate your gender. So when I came on as the presenter here, whether you realize it or not, you were like, oh, he's male. How did you know that? I've got my beard. All these clothes came from the men's department. However, I'm feeling very colorful today, and I've got a lot of like flowery patterns going on. In other words, nobody's like mistaken me for an action hero, right? No one's been like, oh, you should be in my movie. And that's okay, because that's not what I'm going for. Um, which is all to say, I'm not hyper-masculine, right? But I'm also not like androgynous. I'm just somewhat masculine, right? And really, when our students were given the Minnesota Student Survey, they were able to uh, self-identify as mostly masculine, somewhat masculine, somewhat feminine, or mostly feminine. The majority of our students self-identified into the somewhat categories. However, our society is structured to focus on the mostly categories. But the majority of us are all just kind of in the somewhat category. 
So someone who's transgender, real quickly, their sex assigned at birth is different than their gender identity and or expression. There's a couple key words there. I like to say different than instead of opposite because opposite keeps us in the binary. Everything's different. Neither these two shall meet. Uh, so different than gender identity and or expression. Identity and expression may or may not match up, right? And so uh, a couple reasons expression may not match up. Uh, for a lot of folks, uh, expression can be fluid. So some days they present more feminine, some days more masculine. Um, it also, uh, our young people have a really keen sense of navigating their own safety. Perhaps they don't feel safe to uh, express themselves in a certain way. There's also the privilege of accessing those items, right? So having the privilege to um, uh, purchase a chest binder or purchase jewelry, right? So sometimes we might meet students or meet people who uh, provide us with a pronoun that maybe just based on expression and the way our brains are wired, we don't understand or read. But it's also just up to us to just still acknowledge what they told us and respect them, right? And use the pronouns that they ask us to, even if we don't quite understand at that first instinct why, why they're using it. So sex assigned to birth, different than gender identity, and or expression. So let's unpack just four strategies uh, about how we can make more inclusive classrooms, and then I'll wrap up and we'll have achieved our, our goal in uh, roughly 20 minutes. So, oh, we're actually doing pretty good. Okay, so inclusive curriculum. Um, I use these uh, as, as the first go around um, because this is how we can do some really great inclusive curriculum in, in early education. So preschool, kindergarten, and on. And it's just using books. It's using books that are representative, uh, books that uh, have great stories and great art, and also some compelling critical thinking questions. Uh, so some that I like to point out, um, Julian is a Mermaid is my new favorite like children's book, you all know it. It's got beautiful artwork, um, and uh, it's a beautiful story, and it's just a story about creativity and family and uh, joy, and it's not one of those stories that are like, hey, here's a boy who's acting a little different, and here's all the struggles that come with it. Right? It's just a story of creativity, and it just paints a beautiful future, right? Um, another one is uh, called Neither, uh, and this has been really great because we've been having questions about how do we explain non-binary identities to our preschoolers. If a teacher is, doesn't identify as a boy or a girl, how do we explain that to preschoolers who are just learning that there's only boys and girls? Enter Neither, <laughs> right? Um, and in, in a world of uh, just chickens or just ducks, there's only chickens, and there's only ducks, and there's only this, and there's only that, until one day, someone is born that's neither, right? And so it's also a really great way to get people thinking about how all the rules were told out. There's only one or the other option. There's actually more ways of being, right? And so that's a really great book to read and introduce as a way to introduce non-binary ways of thinking. And then the middle one is called Red, a Crayon Story. It's one of my other favorite books. Um, and it's about a red crayon that only colors blue, and they're like, draw a strawberry, and then it just draws a blueberry. And they're like, draw fire, and it draws water. Um, but it teaches the critical thinking skill of there's more than one way to be a red crayon. Or there's more than one way to be a boy. Or there's more than one way to be a girl. Or whatever label or story we're told about ourselves based on our identity, whether it's our race, our religion, our class, our family structure, our countries of origin, whatever stories we're told, well, guess what? There's more than one way to be that. And it, that, what a great skill to be teaching at a really early age. And you can start doing that regardless of what your gender inclusion policies are or regardless of your community support around LGBT students. These are just good critical lessons for all of our students to learn. So those are some books that we have there. I think about in, in middle school grades or high school grades, what a fun uh, project it would be to have people uh, research and explore different social constructions of gender across the world and throughout time because you would see so many examples that don't look like how we structure it here in America, right? Some cultures have 13 words for gender, right? Here in America, we've had two for a really long time and we're just now starting to tease that apart. So what a great way to normalize the idea that societies construct gender in their own way by having them research and look at that for themselves. Supportive educators. Um, uh, there's lots of things we can do around being a supportive educator. Um, redirecting negative gender-based language is a big one. Um, if you are like me, you might have been born in, the, uh, in a conflict-averse Midwestern community. And so, I, I don't know, just, uh, just a hunch. Um, so, uh, I think it's really great to have a few things in your back pocket. Because for me, 
somebody says something, and I know I heard it, but I've got 30 pairs of eyes, and my fight or flight, like, uh, like kicks in, right? And then I go home, and I'm like, I should have said something, and I didn't say anything, and then I can't sleep at night, and I want you all to be able to sleep <laughs> right when you go home. So I think it's good to have a few things in your back pocket about how you're going to redirect that language. And a really easy thing is, you know what? In this school, we really value respect. What I heard you just say there didn't sound very respectful. Would you like to try that again? So you're not calling the kid bad. You're not saying, don't do the thing. You're uh, saying, hey, how you heard, said that, that doesn't quite align with our school values. And in the restorative moment, would you like to try that again? Right? So it just kind of gives a little pause and, and invites them back in. Um, avoid breaking classrooms up by gender. I had a first grade student who uh, their parents were talking to me when they were in kindergarten. Uh, they came home uh, from school tired every day. Not tired because they were like running around, having fun, like all that sort of stuff. They were psychologically and emotionally tired every day. Because every day that teacher broke that classroom up into boy and girl, boy and girl, boy and girl. And it just, for that student, drained them. They were in a classroom that didn't do that. It completely changed their entire experience. So that's not something that takes policy, that takes a year and a half and $15,000 or anything like that. That's just stuff we can do tomorrow but with a little bit of awareness and a little bit of intention. There's a lot of different strategies, and we can talk about some of those uh, in our question and answer session if you like. Inclusive curriculum, supportive educators, enumerated bullying and harassment policies. And in 2014, we um, uh, took the task of looking at all of our policies in Minneapolis public schools, any of them that related to gender, and just made sure that it included uh, transgender and gender nonconforming students and staff inside that policy. And it helped move us along and really opened up the pathway to a lot of great work. If you're looking for policy um, examples, we've got them in Minneapolis. We've got them in St. Paul, starting to see them in surrounding suburbs. And then also uh, MDE, the Minnesota Department of Education, has their trans toolkit, which has policy recommendations for the whole state of Minnesota. So that's some ways to do some of that um, policy work. Last but not least, GSA student groups. So GSAs, uh, if you are a child of the 80s or 90s, uh, you knew them as Gay Straight Alliances. Uh, they're now updated to Gender and Sexuality Alliances. So the language is updated. Um, uh, but it's a, a bit more inclusive in the language. And so when I started this position seven years ago, we had about seven different GSA student groups in the district. We now have 22 across the whole district, right? Which is a great, so the growth has been phenomenal. Um, and it keeps growing and the work keeps happening. All right, so earlier I mentioned that um, this work is work that impacts everybody and that's true. But this is also work that impacts our transgender and gender nonconforming students specifically. Um, and so I just want to share some data. And so as the trans communities gain more visibility, uh, one thing we've heard is those stories of um, depression, homelessness, uh, high unemployment, suicidal ideation. And those stories are true, and I don't want to turn away from that reality. However, I want to add more narratives to that. I don't want that to be the single story. And especially if you're a young person, I don't want that to be your single story or your future, right? So in the yellow column, and I apologize if it's hard to see this, in the yellow column, it shows what life looks like without uh, parent support. In the blue column, it shows what life looks like with parent support. So uh, without parent support, 55% uh, are facing housing problems based on gender. Only 15% are uh, saying very good mental health. 75% are suffering depression. 57% have suicidal ideation. With support, all those numbers change by 50 percentage points or more. So 55% goes down to 0% based on gender for housing, 15% good mental health up to 70, depression goes from 75% down to 23, suicidal ideation goes from 57% down to 4%. So we have the power to make a change for our students. This tells me that being born transgender is not inherently hard, it's that society around transgender people make it hard. So we have an urgent task right now to make sure that our students end up in the blue column and not the yellow column. And our action or our inaction is actively pushing our students into one of those two categories. Um, and I don't want to give up the game, but this is actually pretty easy work, <laughs> right? It just takes a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of intention to make a huge difference for our students. Um, that is my time with you all. I thank you and I look forward to talking with you more.